Hello, Booktube. Today we're finishing up our read along of Heretics of Dune uh, by Frank Herbert, part of Dune Tube 2019, where we read all of the original Frank Herbert Dune novels uh, one a month from July until December. <laughs> uh, and we've been we've been trucking along with the Dune books since summertime. Uh, my my YouTube colleagues who've been joining this with me have been doing one video a month. Uh, per book, I've been doing normal read-alongs, one you know, one chunk of each book a week, uh, and today we finish *Heretics of Dune*. Uh, this is a, a, a novel that takes place th thousands of years after the events of *Dune*, and yet a lot is the same. There is all of the the societies that girded the world of *Dune* exist still in *Heretics of Dune*. Uh, there's the Spacing Guild. There's the the Planet of Ix. There are the uh, the weird shape changers of the Beanie Tail Aksu, and most especially there is the uh, the parapsychic uh, super sisterhood of the Beanie Gesserit, who with their with their centuries long breeding programs and their political and social manipulations, all of these uh, societies existed during the gigantic events of uh, God Emperor of Dune, it, but they were flattened by the God Emperor himself, by Leto II, who was uh, not human and who had an iron grip over the whole of his, of his galaxy and foresaw that when he was gone, when, his, when that iron grip was gone, uh, chaos would result, famine times, horrible scatterings of humans that are, who had either left the Imperium to avoid his, his iron rule or who would leave in those scattering times, and that members of those scatterings of humans who would go out into the great outer darkness beyond the realms of the Imperium uh, would include members of the Tailaxu, members of Ix, members of the Spacing Guild, and even uh, Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers. And who knew what would happen to them out there? It would be a great uh, jumbling up of humankind's genetic potential. And Frank Herbert, uh, Wisely or otherwise, I love his writing, so I wish that he'd written every every single day and every single moment of this story. But wisely or otherwise, he decided not to show us those days, those years, the famine times. Instead, he picks up uh, when they're over. When uh, the god emperor and his time is a long distant memory, thousand years ago. And uh, all of those other societies are now back at each other's throats. They're all jockeying for uh, both artificial spice the spice melange that gives them all their superior abilities, and also the artificial or the the genuine item, the the real spice that is that is created by sandworms on Dune, on the planet Dune that is now called Rakus, uh, and on the planet Dune, a young woman has arisen. You can see her on the cover here, dancing in front of a sandworm. A young woman has arisen who seems to be able to communicate with sandworms. She's a pivotal biological X factor in this book, and there are two others. Uh, one is obvious at the beginning of the book and for most of the book. The Bene Gesserit have continued the, the uh, tradition that the God Emperor of Dune had of having golas, biological reconstructions made of the old Atreides swordsman and retainer, Duncan Idaho. Just one Duncan Idaho after another. Uh, the Bene Gesserit have continued that, that tradition and their newest gola from... Uh, is being kept in seclusion on one of their on one of their home worlds uh and under guard because they know that the that the manufacturers of this goal of the Bini Telaxu have altered him in some way and they're not completely sure what that alteration is so they're keeping an eye on him and they're kind of sort of thinking about breeding him with the girl on dune who can talk to worms because the Bini Gesserit are all about breeding they can't get it off their minds <laughs> uh uh the, and the one other actor in this story that at first who at first doesn't seem like a biological X factor is the Bene Gesserit's old, and I, by this I mean not only long term but also physically, chronologically, centuries old, uh, Bashar Miles Tag, who is a, a military commander that they have trusted in many, many, many campaigns, and they bring him out of retirement to oversee the protection and eventually the the maturation of the Gola of Duncan Idaho. Uh, and all of that is taking place. There's resistance within the Bene Gesserit. There's, uh, there are all sorts of uh, feints and counterfeints with the Bene Thelaxu. Uh, all of that, though, takes place in the shadow of something much bigger, an external threat, which Frank Herbert realized, you know, again, wisely. 
he needed for this larger storyline. You need an external threat against all of these things, and that external threat is the scattering. The people who left during the famine times, the people who were... Uh, all those different groups of people and different philosophies and whatnot have been out there in the outer dark, beyond the reaches of civilization, doing who knows what, developing who knows what kind of ways, biological and technological, and they are coming back. They want the rich pickings of the Imperium worlds. They are coming back and demanding things, and the biggest, most populous, and most dangerous of those people are a group of women, a kind of weird, distorted, funhouse mirror version of the Bene Gesserit called the Honored Matres, who probably come from uh, subverted Reverend Mothers, who went out into the scattering. These women are uh, a strictly matriarchal society, just like the Bene Gesserit. They have uh, extremely enhanced mental and physical abilities, just like the Bene Gesserit. But they have no discipline. They are coarse. Uh, they are brutal. They are not subtle. And they, as we learn in the concluding chapters that we're reading today, they have also mastered... Uh, a sensual bonding process that is all-consuming. It is, it is the, the ultimate drug, and it gives them the ultimate power over men all around them, and it's a, it's a power that the Bene Gesserit have intentionally denied themselves because it kills even the possessor. It, it hollows out even the possessor. It makes everything into uh, seduction and betrayal. Uh, and Events come to a head at the conclusion of this book. At the end of a read-along, especially a long, month-long read-along, I'm, I'm always of two minds about whether or not to give what, what the 20th century now calls spoilers. Uh, but I guess somebody could come across this video who wasn't part of the read-along. Somebody could come across it years from now if YouTube still exists. Uh, so I won't, I won't give away specifics of what happens at the end to put it mildly a rather big thing happens <laughs> on the planet rackus at the end of this book uh but between then uh, apart from that big ending uh, the reverend mother superior a woman named Teresa, has a plan throughout heretics of dune she has a plan that involves the sandworms of dune and it's an audacious plan and she reveals it to almost nobody uh and it involves it is in some measure a a, a counterpoint to the honored matres. It is, it is a countermeasure in what is clearly going to be a protracted war between these two groups of people. And it catches in its wake these three actors. Uh, Shiana, the girl who can talk to sandworms, the, the, the boy, Duncan Idaho Gola, who is only coming to maturity, but who has secrets inside him, inside built into his flesh by the Bini Telaksu, that we don't know about until the end of this book. At the end of this book, we realize what they are. We realize that he is the ultimate response to these sensual uh, manipulation powers of the Honored Matres. He is the ultimate response to that, something that they can fear and also desire, and that makes him unique and dangerous. And the one thing that comes out of nowhere, the one that is, the one thing that is a surprise, is Miles Tegg, who is captured by the Honored Matres and submitted, subjected to a thing called a T probe, and it is not a descendant or an adaptation of any technology known to the Ixians or to the Bini Telaxu. It is a device from the scattering, and it inflicts pain on such a level, on such a cellular level, on such an unbelievable level, that it changes Miles Tegg. <laughs> it, it, it physically changes him. It accelerates him. It makes him able not only to have a kind of frame-by-frame, moment-by-moment prescience, but also to move incredibly quickly, faster than the eye can follow, a blur of motion, even to the honored mattress. He can kill them easily. Uh, it, it, it exacts an enormous metabolic cost. He needs to eat ravenously, and, and it's obviously a damage to his body, but it, it allows him at key moments in the, at the climax of this book to change the course of the narrative uh, because suddenly he's superhuman. We've seen this pattern many times in the Dune books where suddenly a character will achieve superhuman personal abilities, and that changes things. Uh, it's a pattern that, that Herbert seems to like. He does it in other books, too, not just in the Dune books. So if, you, if you've read uh, some of the rest of his science fiction, unfortunately, he is remembered now exclusively for Dune. And that's a shame, because the rest of his science fiction is quite good. I, I, it's a perfect example. I always say on this channel that if I were ever to come across at a library sale or a yard sale or a used bookstore or something like that, a huge tranche of old mass market science fiction paperbacks, I would get them all. I would gobble them up in a heartbeat, because they're not coming back. Obviously, they're not coming back. They're not going to be reprinted. And 
they're really, really good. And one of the first things I would get, it kicks me, that I, it kills me that I don't have them. I used to have a whole shelf of them, would be the science fiction, the non-Dune science fiction novels of Frank Herbert. Uh, I'd like to read them all again. I'd like to study them all again. Uh, but anyway, that is a pattern that he seems to like uh, in these books, is for, for one particular character or maybe two particular characters to achieve superhuman ability, right? We see it... Uh, uh, at the end of Dune Messiah, uh, with when a, a blinded Paul Atreides, whose eyes have been gutted out of his head, can still see, can still walk around. We see it at the end, famously, of Children of Dune, when uh, young Leto Atreides becomes superhuman. He becomes a superman. Uh, we see it all throughout God Emperor. God Emperor is what exalts that whole procedure, is that, is that, is that Leto II is superhuman personally the whole time. It's not just a question of his political power or his religious power. He's also physically not human. And we see it again in this book. Uh, specifically in the, in the person of Miles Tag, there, the, there is an equal transformation in the young Gola that I'm uh, less able to talk about on a family channel. <laughs> but, but with Miles Tag, Miles Tag becomes uh, the Flash. He becomes superhumanly fast. Uh, and that, uh, I, I don't want to spoil the very ending of the book, any of the major strands. We'll get to that next month. Uh, but there's another... To, to finish out this read-along, there's another, uh, I guess in an English paper you would call it a theme. I hesitate to use such galumphing language on an artist like Frank Herbert. But there's another concern of his, apart from personal transformation, there's another concern of his that, that exists in every book. He hits on it in every book. And he hits on it here, too. Uh, and that it has nothing to do with science fiction. It has nothing to do with personal transformation. It has to do with what, where you get the joy in your life. It has to do with one of the very first deep philosophical questions that's raised in the first Dune book, which is, what makes you human? Herbert never stops talking about that. He never stops thinking about it, and he's never less than fascinating on it. And there's one point I wanted to read to you where Miles Tegg, he is allegedly the captor of the honored Matre and, and of the head honored Matre and her, her uh, brutish lieutenant. They have no idea about his enhanced abilities. They have no idea that he can kill them easily. Uh, so they gloat in front of him, and he takes the time to reflect on that gloating. And it's a great distillation of what I'm talking about. So if you pardon me, I want to read you a bit of it. Uh, Tag took some reassurance from the realization that neither of these two really enjoyed life. He could see that in them clearly with the eyes the sisterhood had educated. The honored Matre and her lieutenant had forgotten or most likely abandoned everything that supported the survival of joyous humans. He thought they probably no longer were capable of finding a real wellspring of joy in their own flesh. Theirs would have, be, would, would have to be mostly a voyeur's existence, the eternal observer, always remembering what it had been like before they had taken to in, the turning into whatever it was they had become. Even when they allowed, or even when they wallowed in the performance of something that had once meant gratification, they would have to reach for new extremes each time just to touch the edges of their own memories. Uh... Not a milligram of naivete remained in either of these two. Nothing was expected to surprise them. Nothing could be truly new for them. Still, they plotted and devised, hoping that this extreme would produce the remembered thrill. They knew it would not, of course, and they expected to carry away from the experience only more burning rage out of, out of which to fashion another attempt at the unreachable. That was how their thinking went. And that's not just Heretics of Dune. We see that all throughout the Dune books. The Dune books, in addition to grand science fiction and grand space opera and all sorts of stuff like that, ecological concerns, all the other stuff that's involved in these books, they are concerned all throughout with that exactly. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what of these worlds or societies you come from, are you real or are you not? It's, it's a question that, of course, Herbert uh, brings into, a, you know, a personalized typification with the Golas. Are they real or are they not? Are they Duncan Idaho or are they something else? But he, he brings it up in, re, in, re, in respect to everybody. Are you real or are you not? I would argue, having just finished rereading God Emperor of Dune for the umpteenth millionth time, that the, the whole question of am I real or am I not is the reason for the turning point in, in the God Emperor in Duke Leto that brings about the climax of that book. And there are characters all throughout that are like that. Why, in, in God Emperor, for instance, to revert back to that book, what is Leto's fascination uh, with Malki, the, the previous uh, 
Ixian ambassador. What, what is his fascination with Malki? We meet Malki in, in the final scene of the book, in one of the final scenes of the book, right before Malki dies. We meet him and we see them talk to each other. And he's, he's not much different from a lot of heretics throughout the book who don't particularly like Leto. And yet Leto is fascinated with him. Why? I would argue because Malki is a real person. And what do what do they fashion to the ultimate nth degree in Hui Nori, the ultimate real person? I I think it's fascinating. I, I love I love reading that and trying to piece together what's going through Herbert's mind when he hits on that point over and over again. Uh, but one way or another, that brings us to the end of Heretics of Dune, and the end of a fairly big chapter in the events of Dune, as those of you who finished this book will know. A fairly big thing happens at the end of this book. <laughs> Something that should, by rights, change the title of all future Dune books. <laughs> but uh, we're going to wrap this up now. I, of course, want to know what you made of this book. Uh, uh, a typical complaint that people have made to me about this book over the years uh, is that it's formless. There are things that happen and more things that happen, but it doesn't seem to have a beginning, a middle, or an end. And that, unfortunately, that complaint also extends to the next book, to Chapter House Dune. I myself think that maybe that might be true, but that at this point in in Herbert's career, in this point in his maturation as an artist, it's almost beside the point. Uh, but I'm interested to know what you think. So, so we're going to wrap this up, and that brings us to uh, next month's read along, where we finish Dune Tube 2019 with Chapter House Dune. This is the, these are the great uh, Ace paperbacks that uh, that of re reprinting the whole of these books, and. Uh, I'm going to have to disappoint you. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I knew perfectly well in July what the what December is like for me. I knew perfectly well what that... And yet, I, I cavalierly went into this thing, uh, promising you the moon. <laughs> so, uh, there's going to be a slight change in our read-along uh, for December. For December, I am going to shift to the normal Dune Tube pattern. The Dune Tube pattern of the other members of Dune Tube. And we're just going to talk about this book once. I hate to do it. It will probably be a long video, uh, but it'll only be once. So in the third week of December, I'm thinking sometime around the 14th, 15th, 16th, something like that. In the third week of December, we will discuss Chapter House Dune and the whole of the Dune books in one video. But I'm not going to do weekly read-alongs of this book, so that I won't. There's no reason for me to give you, you know, chapter uh, divisions or or page divisions or whatnot. This is another 600-page book. Uh, so. I, I will, in, in deference to the fact that if we're not doing chapter week-by-week week read-alongs, you might not have finished the book by the third week in December. I'll be very careful about spoilers. I'll talk in generalities. Uh, but we're, we're going to do that uh, for the month of December. So uh, I want to hear what you thought of Heretics of Dune, but don't expect a regular Dune uh, read-along video next week. It's only going to happen once in December for a chapter house, which finishes out Frank Herbert's Dune books. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now, but we will reconvene in the third week of December. <laughs> Thank you, book two.